All right, so this is looking at metapopulations and conservation. So we looked at this Levin's metapopulation model. And so now we understand some things about how this model is expected to work um, in you know, a highly um, artificial environment. But um, let's, let's now bring a little bit of reality into it. So from this model, what we know is um, that slow colonizing species, right? Species that um, either don't move around very much or their populations grow really slowly. They're big, maybe they're big animals that can't move around very much is going to make, well, when there's slow colonization in regards to extinction, it's going to make high vacancies. Okay, so you might have uh, patches that, you know, don't have a species for 50, 60, 100 years. Now, is this necessarily a problem? Um, no, right? If, if humans aren't screwing anything up, this isn't a problem. But when people want to use spaces for certain things, unoccupied patches definitely become undervalued. So if we think about like an Arctic area where if you were to go there and maybe fly a helicopter over, you'll find huge areas where the caribou are, you know, everywhere and um, in the rivers and grazing the land. But then you'll go over vast swatches of land that there are, you know, no caribou here, right? Now, does that mean that this land is, if we're trying to conserve caribou populations, let's say there's an extinct, or not an extinct, but in, the, in a population that's in trouble, um, is this land that has currently no caribou in it, or maybe hasn't had caribou for a while, is that useless? And the answer is no. Given this population model, those empty patches are extremely important. If you get rid of those empty patches, you're going to be hurting this species that could have gotten there at a later date. Um, so, and this is particularly bad when we think about this thing called extinction death. Okay, if you look at um, uh, at a species, given in the metapopulation. Um, scenario here. So here's our little meta population, right? So let's say this is some sort of endangered species that we find in these different patches. Um, and again, the blue is where the species are, and the white is, you know, an, an unoccupied patch. Um, as we go through time, if we get rid of so we got rid of those, let's, we build houses on those patches or something, and we take uh, off that, um, that those patches. What's going to happen is you're basically making less area available, and you're going to find some unoccupied patches. If we then continue to take off more, There might be some recolonizations, but eventually, as we get through time, we're going to. Um, it, it it takes time for this this background extinction rate to take effect. Okay, and with a really quickly um, reproducing species, that's right here. We see this. Then that that's that's this line, right? Um, it it's pretty quick through time where at so so this dotted or this solid line is habitat change where we're decreasing like the amount of habitat right and it, we're we're eliminating patches okay and when so it looks like we're getting rid of about half the patches here so if we get rid of the the patches and we say okay we just got basically done here getting rid of the package the the patches if it's a fast reproducing species that colonizes colonizes really quickly and extinction goes really quickly well we would see this this decrease in the number of species the occurrence um, the population size to go very quickly but it might be in here right so trees are a great example of this where you have you know a an oak tree that um, can live 300 years, right? So if you 
get rid of a bunch of patches of oak trees around uh, around you know a specific patch here um, you cut down a bunch of patches right you might be sitting in you cut down all those patches right here and this might take you know potentially a thousand years for this extinction debt to catch up and decrease and go to you know go to essentially extinction so if this is a thousand years um, you know we're not going to be able to see that and we can see this with species that are you know at medium um, medium lifespans um, you know like bigger mammals things that um, as the population goes away their um, or as the patches go away their population takes some time to to go away now this is you, there, there's an analogy that we can make to epidemiology that might help you um, kind of think about this this scenario in the, the context of, of, of a disease with a vaccine. Okay, so let's say in this case the disease I should have maybe maybe written that here. The disease is the endangered species that we're talking about. And I mean, it doesn't necessarily need to be endangered, I guess, but whatever species we're talking about here, uh, a, a migration then is the transmission or so the transmission of the disease is the migration and the loss of habitat then is a vaccine, right? So when we vaccinate a, a person, um, we make that habitat patch, that person, unavailable to the disease, unavailable to the species, okay? And um, this, this little video here is going to really show, you know, what happens. And this is the idea of that, th that herd immunity that many of us know about. But when you have the habitat basically all available to the disease, that, that disease can go in and through the population many, many, and, and, and it's just going to be just fine. So this is like a pristine habitat with a bunch of different patches. Um, as we start to lose some of the habitat to the vaccine, it still doesn't matter. That's okay. Um, but as we start to lose a decent amount of the habitat, we see that our species is starting to go away. And um, what we see is we don't, d depending on the transmissibility of the vaccine, uh, of the disease, you don't need to actually have um, that much vaccination to protect the whole herd, the whole population of people. So when you're at this 75% um, vaccination, realistically, mo look at all these little blue areas. Those blue areas are areas where that vac uh, the, the, the disease could potentially get to, um, but it's just not because it's, um, it, it, it's those unoccupied patches that that, that that species is never getting to. So and frankly, when we think about how much uh, you know pristine habitat is left, we're sitting here in this world of ninety percent, right? If you look at like long grass prairies in um, the United States, it's um, we're at ninety nine percent vaccinated. Basically, we've cut down, we've uh, mowed over or grazed or gotten rid of ninety nine percent of our tall grass prairies. Um, and so we're sitting here in this scenario where um, these metapopulation, uh, you know, dynamics are really, really fighting against us. And um, we should expect, you know, even though there, there, there might be a couple habitats that are okay, they're really, um, you know, not useful from a metapopulation perspective. There is good news, though, that um, artificial corridors are, you know, artificial increases in migration. Let's say we do have a habitat fragmented, you know, where you have a forest over here and a forest over here, two different forest fragmentation patches. What we can do is we can make um, migration corridors, movement corridors. So if you were to plant trees here like they did here, um, the species from or the individuals of the population from um, 
meta population A are more easily uh, migrating to uh, the forest B here. And remember what happens is when we increase that migration, what happens is you actually decrease the uh, the, pop the the that p hat that um, percentage of unoccupied patches, right? So the more movement you have, the more um, the more population size you can have, and the more patches that you have that will be occupied. Um, another example that we're doing this with is um, oh, I'm blinking on the name of these fish right now. Uh, uh, Palidon spatula. Um, that's the. Um, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I'm blanking on the name. That's the species name, but um, there's no planktivorous. And what they do is they um, are really bad at migrating around dams. Um, they they have this really sensitive nose that paddlefish. Oh my gosh, that's what they are, right? Paddlefish. Um, I don't. Um, what they do is their um, their their paddles are sensitive to electrical um, impulses, and they don't like to be around dams, especially hydroelectric dams, and they they stay away from them or they get caught at the bottom of them. So essentially, what we see is even in the Missouri River, um, where these species were generally, um, that what they're doing is they're um, the, the DNR and, and various um, state DNRs are taking these fishes, these fish, and um, pretty much doing all of the migration for them. Um, they they spawn and they're the, what's happening here is they're um, taking a female and getting the eggs from her, and then they will spawn these um, these paddlefish in these ponds here, and um, they will grow and grow up into be smaller fish that they'll then take to a variety of different places. And it's pretty much all of the migration of this fish is done artificially or is human mediated. So the thing about these, uh, these assisting in migration is that you really need to predict the future sustainability, suitability of the patch. Um, the what we see is in a climate change scenario um, or you know just any environmental change um, but especially now is we're seeing the um, you know future suitability if we are going to try to um, help these fish move to patches of rivers where they can survive we really need to see okay is this going to be wasted effort or do we need to um, um, you, you, if we were to put them in there and then in 10 years the, the climate changes enough such that they're all going to die, well, that's, that's, that's not a good thing. That was all wasted effort, right? Um, and what we see is this is a really great example of, of, uh, of a bunch of different bird species that are changing where they spend their winter, okay? Uh, and these are happen to be the 20 species with the most movement but um, what we can see is pretty much you know all of these different the American goldfinch that little yellow bird that you find everywhere are moving up f much farther north um, so all of these um, you know all of these species are really moving moving up uh, to over winter in much warmer places um, and you know this if if this is 200 miles here, this is, you know, come, I don't know, at least 600 miles or so. So there's huge differences here when we're thinking about um, how certain species will be reacting to these climate change scenarios.